God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Chisel. Here. Bell Richard. Here. Carlson. Here. Blues. Here. Bergen. Here. Hadley. Here. Johnson. Here. I, I want to make sure that I introduce Alex who's going to be the Luther representative as Alex also has a class on. I looked over to do it the last time and it was blank. So, welcome. Uh, approval of the agenda. Is there any changes in the agenda? I'll motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Bell Richard? Aye. Bergen? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Luce? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Chisel? Aye. Okay, under public comment, we've got Dave Boss from Northeast Iowa Community Action Corporation. And we'll just have you and your partner step right up to this microphone. Uh, I'm Trisha Wilkins, and I'm actually. Let's check the. I think it's on. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Can you hear me? You'll turn it up a little bit. Is it better if I just. No, talk? if you're closer, it's better. Okay. We're always trying to get away from the mics well, as much can, as we can. You can pull it closer to yourself okay. also. Well, I'm Trisha Wilkins. I'm the executive director of Northeast sure. Iowa Community Action. And I'm the new director. I've been with the agency for about 10 years. And I've been in this role for about nine months. And so um, thank you for allowing us to come tonight. I just mainly wanted to introduce myself, but also um, let you know how grateful we are to have the support in our agency from the city of Decorah. Um, we provide a variety of services, and many of you I know know who we are and what we do, but we could not absolutely do what we do with just the, the federal and state funding sources that we receive. We need the community support um, from all of our cities and all of our communities that provide it, and, and you've given us what we've asked for, and we always appreciate that. Um, and having said that, when we ask for the support, I guess I think it's really important to let you know what we do with that. So that's why Dave and I are here, and we're not gonna take much of your time tonight because we know you have a busy agenda. Um, so David is gonna talk about our programs a little bit, and he's also going to talk um, about specifically services provided in Decora and Winnishi County to give you guys a better idea of how we use your funds to assist those in need, so. Justice. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm uh, David Boss. I'm Deputy Director and also Director of Community Outreach and Development. I've been with the agency for just over 20 years. Um, some of you I've known for a long time. Some of you I've known since you were a lot younger, and I was a lot younger. Uh, the handout, two things. One is our agency brochure, uh, and I have more if anybody in the crowd would like one afterwards. Um, just a quick brief synopsis of the major programs that we operate underneath our umbrella. We do cover seven counties, Allen McKee, Clayton, Winnesheek, uh, Fayette, Howard, Chickasaw, and Bremer. Uh, our main administrative offices are here in Decorah, the old hospital, the Smith Building. Uh, that's, that's basically the heart of our agency as far as all the management and leadership go. Uh, we do operate everything. We have family service offices in each county. Uh, our Winnesheek office is in the basement of the old hospital there where our main building is. We also administer the Winnesheek County General Assistance Program for the Winnesheek County Supervisors. We also operate the Winnesheek County Food Pantry, which is part of the General Assistance Program. It's aimed strictly at residents of Winnesheek County that are very low income. Uh, as you see all the Earl public transit vehicles running around, uh, that is another one of our programs, is the regional transit, uh, which the center hub for that, all the dispatch and scheduling is done out of the main building in Decorah. Uh, low income home energy assistance program, which often is referred to as fuel assistance, is another one of our programs. That's kicking off October 1st for households that have someone who is <coughs> excuse me, 60 and older, they consider senior. <laughs> somebody else wrote that. <laughs> or if somebody's disabled in the house, that can be October applications. Everyone else waits until November 1st. Uh, weatherization is another program that we do. A lot of the homes that were built prior to 1950 had no exterior wall insulation, so we do uh, 
Well, there are scientific uh, evaluations of homes, pressurizing, depressurizing, infrared cameras, and try to correct uh, uh, insulation primarily in homes that have high energy usage. It's a win-win for everybody. We're not using up the resource, and a low-income family's not having half their limited resources go going toward paying for heating. Early childhood programs, we run Head Start and Early Head Start programs in Winnesheet County. Decorah, we have a classroom, uh, West Side School, and we also recruit for the Early Head Start program, which is a home-based program. Housing, uh, you see on the sheet, we've got three major housing initiatives that we've done just in Decora. Uh, Washington Court, the 16-unit senior housing complex. Uh, the Woolen Mill, uh, the old Decora Tire, the three-story brick building now is 15-unit multifamily housing. Then we partnered with Habitat for Humanity and built the Ridgewood Duplex uh, just next to the, between the AEA and the hospital there on Montgomery. That houses four individuals. Uh, we do have a community adolescence pregnancy prevention program. That's the only remnant we have left from our health clinic, unfortunately. Our health clinic closed just over a year ago after I don't know how many years of successful operation. But our community adolescent pregnancy prevention program is basically a young lady that's been doing this for 10 years, goes into the school districts and has those conversations with kids from classes fifth through 12th age-appropriate curriculum, all fact-based, science-based, uh, so that these kids don't have to wonder, how come nobody ever had that talk with me? Uh, we also have a family development self-sufficiency program that we operate uh, quite a bit out of Winnesheek and Fayette County. Uh, households that are on FIP, the uh, State of Iowa's Family Investment Program, which is what the, the cash assistance is now called. If a household's on FIP, they can volunteer for this program. We'll get a specialist that will work them and help them identify their strengths, knock down their barriers, and hopefully get them self-sufficient. Um, the handout, the sheet of paper, uh, little, try to do a little comparison to put things in perspective. Quite honestly, in our database where we track everything we do and all the clients we work with, I am not able at this time to pull out Decorah mailing addresses that are in the city limits. Mm -hmm. So at least these are people that say Decorah is their home, even though they may not live in the city limits. They don't call Calmer or Fort home. So in last year, 2017, our fiscal year 2017, which ended September 30 of 17, in just Winnesheet County, we served 1,422 unduplicated persons. You'll see this year in Winnesheet County, we're at 1276. It's down a little bit, but in 17, we did have quite a bit of disaster assistance. And we also seems, we did like 19 weatherized homes in Winnesheet County, where this year we did seven. So there's a huge difference there. For Decorah, for the same time frame, out of that 1422 Winnesheet County served, 912 of those unduplicated persons had Decorah mailing addresses this year, 845. And the services you see in the next column, and you see the dollar amounts expended. And you see that asterisk identifying those bigger numbers in 17 than in, than in 18. Uh, a lot of that was disaster assistance, because we administer the uh, Iowa Individual Assistance Grant Program. When the governor declares a county a disaster and includes the Iowa Individual Assistance Grant Program, the community action agency that has that county administers the program. So if you look back at 16, all seven of the counties we serve were declared twice within 30 days. We got kind of busy. Then last year we had more stuff in 17. This year the declarations haven't resulted in too many people even inquiring. Um, probably gives you pretty good. On the back of the sheet, you'll see the current federal poverty guidelines. If you match that up with the narratives in the, in the brochure, if a program has an income eligibility, for example, if you looked at low-income home energy assistance in the top of the center panel, it'll say, to qualify a household's income must not exceed 175% of poverty. If you turn your sheet over, the first column tells you household size. So if you're a household size of four, you go over until you're in that column for 175%. That says the maximum gross income your household can have in order to get assistance through that program. 
I know you got a lot on your agenda. We wanted to come and say thank you for the support, and we're glad we're in Decorah. Any questions from any of you? Any council questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank First of all, I want to thank uh, Bill Nixon for setting me up for this. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, he came into my office and said, would you like to give the annual report? He was all nonchalant. I said, yeah, that'll be no problem at the council meeting. He said, I won't be there. I said, that'll be no problem. I turned the corner to pull in the parking lot and saw that, and I went, oh, he got me. <laughs> <laughs> but he's still not around, and his office is open, so <laughs> see who gets the last laugh. <laughs> Chief Nixon did tell me that he sent this to everyone in an email message, so uh, as was stated before, I know there's a lot on the agenda. So I'm going to go through some things, uh, just hit some high points, and if you got any questions, I can take them at the end. Um, start off with training. Training is a priority for us. It's uh, how we invest in our staff. You can see uh, we attended over 800 hours of training as a police department staff did. Uh, this is how we invest in our people by training them in relative issues. It also helps prepare our, pe prepare our people for future leadership positions. And if you skip down to presentations, uh, this is kind of a key component of what we do too as a small police department. We want to get out in the public and uh, engage them. You see that uh, we put on 32 presentations throughout the community. Various topics are listed there. Uh, this is a great way for us to stay connected with the community, engage them in a positive way, not just in a law enforcement or a law enforcement uh, standpoint. Total calls for service handled by our dispatch center was way up this year. I contacted the chief to see uh, when he was compiling these numbers if there was a reason for that, if there's some statistic that stood out. He said there really was not. If you go through, you look at the uh, total decor of police calls for service, including assisting other agencies. That was also up quite a bit this year. Uh, tough to account for it. Tough to say spe specifically why that is. Um, our 911 calls are up. Our wireless calls are up. Uh, call for service could be anything from a 911 call to uh, somebody calling up to say, hey, there's a stick in my yard, or I can't get the oven open, I got two pies in there. So, uh, <laughs> tough, tough to say why the increase is there. Uh, total number of accidents reported within the city of Decorah is up quite a bit this last year. Um, reading through the numbers, I found that kind of interesting because I see that our traffic citations are also up. You would think the more people are starting to cite for traffic offenses, that would decrease the traffic uh, accident numbers, but it did not. Kind of an interesting statistic. On the Decor Police Department organizational chart, I was just informed that uh, Patrol Officer David Barrett is not listed on that sheet. He should be on there uh, near Logan Hop. Um, and going through our Decor Police Department personnel list, you see the years of service listed next to everyone's names. A uh, couple things to look at there. Uh, we're becoming a younger department. If you notice, we got a lot of younger guys out on the street. We're hiring a lot of younger guys. Uh, this means uh, less experience, not a bad thing. Uh, new responsibilities for all of us, uh, I don't want to say older folks, but people with more experience to uh, teach people, but also to listen to uh, different thoughts, different ideas. You know, that's good for our agency as well. What the young people also bring to the agency is kind of a renewed vigor. It, it gets us re-engenerized re, uh, re or enthusiastic about getting out and uh, doing our job. So it's a good thing that we're getting some younger folks. We have two new dispatchers coming on board. Uh, one thing I also want to bring to note is uh, Terry Bollock under the dispatchers, if you look at her name, 35 years of service. Uh, Terry's leaving us in one month. She's done. This is her last month of work. She's been our only clerk for the last 30 plus years. So we're in the transition of training somebody to do that job, and that's been going on for about a month, and it will continue to go on until she's done, so we make sure we have that role filled. But uh, we're going to be sad to see her go. That's a lot of years of service and a very hard-working woman. Going into the incidents by type numbers, um, we stayed real consistent this year. There was no significant changes from uh, 2016 to this year. You see uh, some of the leading things we deal with are thefts, uh, narcotic violations, and uh, drinking and drug driving. Uh, 
our arrest by type, uh, if you take a look at those numbers, uh, the same thing with incidents. There's no real consistent change and uh, everything seems to be the same. Again, our drug violations are way up for arrest numbers. Uh, same thing for drug equipment and also the driving or under the influence. Quick look at the narcotics activity in Decora. We have some numbers there that are kind of surprising. Uh, cocaine seems to be back in the area. With, uh, 13 different arrests for that. Marijuana, which is always prevalent, is back up in numbers. Methamphetamine's on the rise again. Again, I know everybody's got this document from Bill in their, uh, in their drop boxes. I want to thank you for your continued support for our police department. We greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, I can take them now or later on, whatever you want. Your organizational chart where the offices are to the right of you, and is that like a connection point to authority, or is it just a sub... <laughs> In the, in, you know what I mean? So Brent Parker to the right of Assistant Chief, is that connection? Uh, yep, that's who uh, I work with on a day-to-day -day basis and Sarah works with Captain Herman on a day-to-day -day basis, so okay. there's a connection. Thank you. Any other questions? Dave, new for this year's report are calls coming in via text, mm -hmm. and I know that's a new service that's been started. How's that working for you, and can you describe how that works? Uh, as you said, it's a new um, implementation for the dispatch center and a means of taking a call. Instead of a 911 call, someone can text a call in. I'm not too familiar with the way it works. I haven't sat in the dispatch center through it, and um, I did see there was a couple of them that came in, but uh, I got a feeling you're going to see an increase in that number over the years. Mm -hmm. I always appreciate seeing you guys out and about whether it's at Culver's, or Magpie, right. the library, whatever. Um, but I appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dave. Dave. Consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of the minutes of the September 4, 2018 meeting. Claims. Consider C3 commercial design review for 2015 West Water Street for Modish LLC for a sign and some window changes on the front facade. Resolution 2924, setting a date for a public hearing on conveyance of a portion of Kerr Drive for October 1, 2018 at 5.45 p.m. Change order number four for Trout Run Trail Restoration, Doug Road, totaling $77,334.11. Partial pay estimate number four, Trout Run Trail Restoration, Doug Road, in the amount of $16,939.66. Partial pay estimate number five, Trout Run Trail Restoration, Doug Road, in the amount of $16,112.55. This is a final and release of the retainage. Resolution 2919, accepting the Trout Run Trail Restoration Doug Road Project as complete. And Resolution 2923, approving the 2018 Urban Renewal Report. I have a move to approve. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Uh, discussion? Second. Sec second. Oh, sorry. Second. Thanks, Steve. Okay, now discussion. <coughs> Ben Hurd, roll call. Bergen? Aye. Adley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Chisel? Aye. Bell Richard? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Luce? Aye. Uh, consider resolution 2920 setting a public hearing on rezoning of property Echo Development in Randall Olson Decorah Business Park Suite Partway property. A parcel from annexation to R3 multifamily residential district and a parcel from C5 Office Park Commercial to R3 multifamily residential district. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Luce? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Bergen? Aye. Chisel? Aye. Bell Richard? Aye. Consider resolution 2921 setting a public hearing and providing 
notice of hearing on proposed amendment to the revitalization plan for 2014 Decorah Housing Urban Revitalization Area. I move to approve resolution 2921 to set that public hearing. Second. Any discussion on that? Hearing none. Roll and call. Oops. I was, sorry. And this was I'm was sorry. this at the request of Echo Development then? Uh, yes, and uh, the representatives are here, Brent and, and Corey, uh, and this is uh, Dan coming out of uh, one of your committee meetings in terms of their initial presentation and asking for an abatement program to go with their apartment complex. So to amend your current abatement program for residential construction, that needs to be amended. This is the required, setting the required public hearing for that for October 1st. Did we have a first and second? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you have motion by Bergen and okay. second by Carlson to set the date for the public hearing. No further discussion. Roll call. Bergen? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Luce? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Chisel? Aye. Bell Richard? Aye. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and Mayor, I think um, if you'd like, Corey and Brent might want to say a few words about their project if that's appropriate. Sure. Brent Dahlstrom, Echo Development. Um, I will make it very quick. Uh, thanks for uh, your service and, and, and allowing us to speak a little bit tonight. Uh, I will not be here in two weeks because it's my seventh anniversary with my wife, and so I wanted to <laughs> see if there's any questions I could answer tonight, but Corey will do a great job at the next one. We're excited about the possibility of um, developing into Cora. The vast majority of my family uh, comes from Northeast Iowa, and including my mom and dad. And so, I've uh, been lucky enough to develop apartment buildings and residential housing throughout Iowa and, and Wisconsin. And so, I uh, would love nothing more than to partner with Decora to, to build a great project here. And uh, if there are any questions, I can take them via email or now, and I assume that it'll be later. But I'd love to get, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to, to know or questions that you have or to compare it to other cities um, that we've been in, um, please feel free to reach out to me or um, you know, prepare it so I can have Corey ready for those questions. But thank you so much for your time tonight um, and uh, look forward to uh, working with Decora. Okay. Well, there is a map. I'll direct a map on the wall for the business park. Um, if you have any questions um, as to exactly where it's located, ask me when time comes. So. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, conduct a public uh, comment section on rezoning a property, Menards Old Stage Road. Uh, County Road A52 parcel to C4 Shopping Center Commercial District. Uh, this is the second uh, public comment time. Um, the guidelines will be I request the people that spoke last time not get up and speak for a second time. Allow other people to come up. Um, I will be starting the discussion with Stephanie from who will just give a general overview of the business park. Um, and how that works out. Then I will um, ask for public comment, and then there will be time for a presentation by um, Tyler Edwards. So, Stephanie. Hello. Uh, the mayor just asked me to come and kind of speak on behalf of Decorah Jobs, Winnipeg County Development. Uh, Decorah Jobs does own the business park here, and there's been a lot of uh, discussion about sending Menards up the hill to our location. I just wanted to kind of do a, a brief overview of what that site has to offer. Um, so the 27 and a half acres or so that we purchased one year ago, it's not completely shovel ready, obviously. Um, there's about two acres of DOT property that we still have to acquire that runs parallel with the highway. Uh, that process has been started. It's about a year into it, uh, but it does take about two to three years to uh, you know, get a price, get it appraised, and then try to buy it from the DOT. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the site, but it is a little bit uh, hilly and there is a, a deep ravine on the back side of it. Uh, so 
it's not necessarily a wetland, but it does offer some kind of tricky drainage issues. Um, so, you know, if Menards did locate there, they would need to keep that into consideration. Uh, they would have to kind of maneuver that site to make sure it fits, fits them. Um, another point uh, that I wanted to make is the controlled intersection. Obviously, we have started conversations with that because of the increased traffic flow because of toppling. Um, but, and so know that those conversations have been had, uh, but it's important to kind of take that into consideration too that the intersection at Millennium and where the Ocean Blacktop is meeting the highway, uh, that will be a, an intersection that will need to get redone in terms of turning lanes, traffic signals. Um, there is some DOT funding available for that through the USTEP program, uh, but obviously those funds are on a, a, a yearly or annual basis, so you need to kind of get in line and kind of argue your case in order to qualify for those funds. Um, and obviously with any site that uh, a retail outlet like Menards goes to, we need to consider what that's going to do for traffic no matter where we are. So that's with any site really. Um, and then some other just kind of smaller things to consider too. Since we've only owned the property for a year, uh, there's some power lines that will need to get buried. We're kind of waiting for that uh, until we can figure out where the DOT will set their new line parallel to the highway. Uh, we would like to bring those power lines up, bury them so that you can really see the land. Um, site grading, annexation, rezoning kind of uh, steps as well. Um, with any site, there's costs associated with development. So just to kind of give everybody a, a clear picture of that site. If a, if a developer were to develop that site, um, could TIF financing be used to, to, to pay for some of those road and street improvements and other things that, uh, that are part of that expense? Sure, and you have a TIF district set up there already. That is a tool available to the council. The ballpark timeline? As the burying and various things, best case you're hoping? You know, it really de it depends on who the site or the, who the prospect is. Um, we've had a lot of interest since we've bought that property, and the parties, I mean, it's between two acres and 30 acres that they want. So, you know, if it's a two acre parcel, it wouldn't take very long to kind of push things along, but when you're talking about the full 27 and a half or so acres, um, it, it's going to take a little bit of time just in terms of planning and, and what comes first. Uh, we do have like kind of an outline of what we've been doing in the past and we're kind of taking our steps forward with that. Um, but in terms of uh, a direct, I can't really give you that number. Could you speak a little bit, we talked a little on the water mitigation plan and that the runoff that everybody's required to include in their sites? Yeah, we, um, I talked to Lindsay actually after we visited. It's not required, but we do kind of push uh, new development up there to kind of have a plan or have a runoff uh, for their site. So it's kind of something that we kind of just uh, influence these these bigger businesses that decide to pave a parking lot or put a building somewhere that hasn't typically been developed in the past. Um, you know, that, that ranges from what Echo is doing to kind of small plots of, of different runoff catching um, areas versus, you know, Norwegian Mutual is putting in a small pond uh, to catch their runoff as well. So where, wherever Menards decides to go, I, I think that would be, they would have to consider that. Would it make sense for us just to go ahead and start the annexation and rezoning procedures? We have. Just preemptively? We have started that. We've had conversations with Chad, um, and there's just some uh, some things that are, that are just kind of moving parts still with that, that go along with that. There's no reason not to keep that open, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just get it done either way. But it, but it should come from the applicant from Decor Jobs this way. Right. We can talk about it too after. But. Yeah. Might as well get it done. Thank you. All right. Thanks. See. Uh, I'll ask him. Yeah. Okay. Keith Bruning, 
I'm here as a president of Decor Jobs. We support Menards to come to our community out in Freeport. Uh, I think just the, the increase in the jobs, the economic vitality of a Menards, I, I've seen the numbers just in the paper like everybody has. It's five, six hundred grand for, for our town and I'm sure we've got a place to spend it. So uh, our board was completely unanimous to support it and hope you see to let it come to Decora, wherever they go, or if there's some other place they can go. But we support it in Freeport. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ron. Ron Onsager, um, live at 702 Hillside Court. I think we have to think long and hard about the economic impact of the Menards and while I certainly empathize with people who are affected by flooding, um, we have the DNR has already approved the permit, the uh, Iowa Flooding Authority has said it will have very minimal impact on flooding. I don't think you can turn down the opportunity for an additional $600,000 or more in, in additional tax income for the city of Decorah. Um, not to mention the jobs, uh, they're talking 100 to 150 new jobs in Decora, and these are pretty good paying jobs. These are not minimum wage jobs. Uh, Menards has good benefits for their employees. <coughs> Excuse me. I think we need to look at, at some compromises and maybe some negotiation. Um, one of the ideas I was thinking about, and, and I'm not sure what the, the regulations are for cities on how to do this, but why can't you set up a flood mitigation and recovery fund and use some of those additional tax dollars to fund that so we have funds available in the event of flooding? I know in that uh, the previous flood in Freeport in 2016, FEMA came in and the county came in and, and bought out, I believe it was five or six houses uh, that were severely damaged. Um, we could do that if we have the resources available, and we would. If you take, uh, say, $100,000 of that additional tax revenue each year and put that away, in 10 years you've got a million dollars in that fund. A um, couple other things that might be considered, and I don't know how the DNR looks at that, but the city and the county both own a lot of land along the river that probably is not in the floodplain but is adjacent to the floodplain. When Menards needs to fill for their uh, facility, Perhaps we can, and I don't, again, like I say, I don't know if the DNR will go along with that, but why can't we take fill from land that is adjacent to the floodplain, put that land in the floodplain to offset the land that we're removing from the floodplain? If we do that, then there's no impact at all on flooding. Um, so, you know, we need to investigate all the possibilities, but I, I don't think we can, can look lightly on the economic impact for Decora and Winnesheet County. Thank you. Thank you very much. I forgot to reiterate that um, speakers will have four minutes to speak. And they've been fine with them watching. You do. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to say, I'd, I'd like the city attorney to address what happens if the council votes this down. I know in the past when Menard, or Walmart originally wanted to come to Decora, city council voted not to rezone the land. Walmart went to court, won the court case, and it cost the city, memory serves me right, about eighty or $85,000 in court costs. Uh, that's been 30 years ago. The court costs are going to be a lot higher if that happens again. So I'd like the city attorney to address, you know, what are the odds if Menards takes it to court? Uh, do we have a leg to stand on in turning it down, or is there a good chance we're going to be ruled against. Uh, just a correction to the record, the, the original developer was Noddle Development, not Walmart. Right. And that's, that's who sued us and won. Right. But they were developing it for Walmart. Uh, no, they were developing it for another retailer and then Walmart came in much later. Okay. But you're right. Yeah. So, um, would that be a question that might come later? I'm well, looking for advice. Well, on that, I think that's the Peterson case. You've got to take every case based upon its own facts. And that one, I mean, we could go into, we could discuss that case, but it was a very different set of facts. Your question's pertinent. You know, what, under what authority can the city turn down a rezoning request? And in that, in that Peterson case, 
with that, if I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm roughly summarizing this case here, but the city council had, they didn't have the comprehensive plan we have today, but they had some memo basically giving a vague outline of what future development should look like. And that particular piece, they said, yes, we want it to be developed commercially or industrially. They just didn't like the company. They didn't like the proposed development there. It's not that they didn't like the company. Um, they didn't like what they were going to put in. And basically, the Supreme Court said, city, you can turn down uh, a rezoning request for the right reasons, but these weren't the right reasons. And essentially, they said it was arbitrary and capricious, the reasons the, the city turned it down. So uh, long story short, different set of facts, pertinent question, but it's something to keep in mind in this case. Um, but I don't think we use it as a lesson to be, to be careful about, but it's not a reason in and of itself to necessarily turn down a rezoning request or to approve either way. Thank you. Next. Um, Daryl Jensen, 803 Serenity Court, Decorah. Um, I have nothing against Menards coming to Decorah, but I would prefer that they locate outside the floodplain. The Menards store in North Rochester is about as far away from other stores as a store would, as their store here would be if they built by our airport. With the increase in big rain events, and we have just seen the start of it, Menards should be very concerned with their store being flooded. Why not be safe and build on top of the hill and not in a floodplain, endangering lot, <coughs> excuse me, endangering lives and property? When I shop at a big box store, I would rather shop at Home Depot or Lowe's. Home Depot and Lowe's are much more innovative with their, pro with their products. The organization of Home Depot and Lowe's product aisles is much better, and their employers, uh, their employees are more friendly and knowledgeable. I go through Rochester and La Crosse regularly anyway, so I will continue to shop at Home Depot and Lowe's even if there's Menards here. That said, I also do not agree that the new Menards store in Decorah will benefit Decorah at all. Uh, and at, at the time Walmart was built in Decorah years ago, some people felt that Walmart was going to be the, the saving uh, of Decorah's economy. I don't think that has happened. Our taxes continue to increase just as fast or faster than before. There is more crime. Our utility rates continue to be out of control. And according to a recent study, or um, I shouldn't say steady, but observation, our air quality is at times worse than at Des Moines. There are many good reasons concerning growth, but also lots of bad things. These large stores like Menards or Walmart do not bring, do bring more people, but with people, cars and trucks also come with pollution. More crime and the need for more public protection and continued updating of expensive, expensive public transportation and utilities. Is Decora any more ready for these expenses now? Will it get worse or will it get better? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to allow Mike Clemish to speak on behalf of the mayor since the, all of the cities in Winnesha County voted for 4% sales tax and have received benefit to their streets and uh, roads in that fashion. We have like four minutes. I have four minutes? I won't chew up that much time, I promise. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. My name is Mike Clemish. I'm the mayor of the city of Spillville. I'm representing the Winnesha County Coalition of Mayors. We're a fairly new organization. We've had about three meetings. And we got together because as mayors, we never get a vote on anything. So we wanted to vote. So we voted. Unanimously, we voted to encourage you folks to support Menard's petition for rezoning. 
I believe you all received a letter from us in your packet. So I'm not going to read the whole letter, but I'm going to read just the last paragraph of it. We would like you to consider one last thing when making your decision. Each of the eight cities that make up Winnesha County are not islands in and of themselves. We are intrinsically linked together and must consider that link to a degree where we make decisions that potentially have an impact beyond our individual corporate boundaries. Those decisions and their impact will shape each of our cities as well as the county for years and generations to come. While we understand that it is important to consider those factors that affect things closest to home, we must never forget to keep an open eye to the horizon and what the potential larger picture may hold for each of us. As Mayor Borowski spoke, all of the cities in Winnesha County and the county included benefit from the local 1% option sales tax. Spillville, for example, is a small town. We don't have an industrial park. We never will. But my residents benefit from better paying jobs, which means they may add on to their home, they may build a new home, which improves our property tax base. And looking outside the basic financial impact that the city of Decorah stands to receive, improved property tax revenue, their share of the local 1% option sales tax revenue, and the improved uh, <clears throat> improve property tax revenue to the school district as well. It's important for you folks when you make your decision to think not only of your respective districts and your constituents, but of the county because Decorah is the economic hub in Winnesha County. So the decision you're going to make next week or in two weeks is going to affect everybody. It's going to affect Kelmer, Oshin, Spillville, Fort, Jackson Junction, all of us. We all stand to benefit from Menards building a store in Winnesha County economically, improve quality of life. The improvements are many. So we want you to consider that decision when you make those decisions. That your decision reaches beyond Decora. It reaches all of the county because we're all linked together in one shape or form. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. I'm Willard Hansen, uh, 1006 College Drive, Decorah, Iowa. I've uh, lived in Decorah my entire life, uh, the last 61 years in Decorah, and I've never seen any water over the area where Menards wants to build. Now I'm also wondering why when Gunderson wanted to build their clinic in Decorah, nobody objected to that. And I, I don't, I don't, I know, uh, clinic is a good, good thing to Decorah, but uh, I look around the room and a lot of these people in Decor are transplants and moved in from some other areas. And like uh, Ron mentioned, it's a good economy, a lot of jobs brought to Decor, a lot of tax base and that. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but years ago, the uh, city of Decor wanted to put the wastewater treat plant uh, right where it was. And the property owner didn't want to sell at that time. So then they bought land from the county and put it there. So why is it uh, all right for the wastewater treat plant to build there but not Menards? So I think Menards is a good addition to Decorah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Because water has to go back to the river. <laughs> what? Water has to go back to the river. That's why you put a water treatment center mm -hmm. on yeah. the river. Yeah, yeah well, Menards down. is going to build a catch basin to catch that water. Right, but you said why would we put the white the treatment plant there? Well, wasn't that in the floodplain too then? Considered the floodplain? Like I say, I've lived in Decor all my life. I've never seen water there, ever. Right. And how many of you have lived in Decor that long? Even on the council. Right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mayor, just for the record, I would uh, note that Pam Huffman and Jamie Huffman of 704 Rural Avenue did call into the office today in support of Menards. So just enter that in the record. Okay. Steve? Steve Downing, 2404 Tamarack Drive, Decorah. Most, most of you know who I am. I'm the developer that's north of town, or on the east side of town here. I think the big picture here is the rezoning issue. It's not about moving Monards up the hill, or not about where they want. Everyone here has a chance to go where they want to go. We can't tell them where to go if they don't want to go there. I think what we need to look at 
to is your planning zoning commission is an appointed board. You guys are voted in by the public. You need to talk to your constituents out in your wards to find out what really is going on. Because I've had a lot of people tell me that we need that revenue, each and a half of water in Freeport isn't going to make any difference. Well, what if you put Menards up on the hill and you put that apartment complex up on the hill? Where's all that water going to go? Going to go right down the airport hill and right into Gunnarsson Clinic and right into Menards and right into the river where the same water will go if you build Menards in the floodplain or whether it is a floodplain or not. They've done a lot of studies. They've done their due diligence. I think you really need to address the economic impact of this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will read uh, a comment that I've got um, from a person that could not be here. I thought I would drop you a line to ask that you help get Menards in here. I know they talk floodplain, but I live in Freeport and I only have seen the river flood that part once since I've lived here. The flooding we've been getting is the small creeks and runoffs. I have a creek and a drainage ditch in my backyard and it flows really fast, but we're, we're not in the floodplain. Enough said on that. I would love to see Menards here. I think there's more positive than negative if there are any jobs, revenue, and all of us that go to Rochester and the cost now to shop there would have it in our own backyard. I know a lot of people who shop there and lots of money is going out of town. I know you have a lot on your mind, but I thought I would stop and drop you a, and drop you a line. Did you say who, who, who was that? Dolly Panos. Okay. Can you say that again? Dolly Panos. 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 Thank you. Panos. 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 Anybody else? Sure. I wasn't going to talk. Okay. And you didn't, didn't talk last time either, did you? No, because I don't like that, talking in that's front okay. of people. It's okay. You All right, just I'm say who you are and your are Christine address. Radford. I'm at 2512 River Road. That is in Freeport. You know, I hear a lot of talk about all this money coming in and how great that is. Um, how, how much money do you guys think we all spent when we got flooded and we didn't get any help? A lot of us didn't get any help. Nobody bought us out. Our, our, my floors are still damaged because my crawl space was full of water. Mm -hmm. there, there was water in my, that went through my yard, the water lines were this tall. In a spot that had never flooded. My parents' house is over 100 years old. And there are no, it had never flooded. And I live right next door to them, so that's how. <laughs> anyway, um, and we heard last time from a, a lady who had all the numbers with her. I didn't bring anything because I didn't plan on talking it. But I had read about all, all the cases against Menards for their treatment of their employees and wrongdoings, and and the cases of how poorly they have treated the, the, the land, poisoning it literally with toxins. Uh, they have a long record. It's out there. You all have computers. You don't need us to tell you this. Um, also, what about climate change? How many people were out there marching in Decorah for the science march? Where are they now? Climate, climate change is just as real now as it was right after the election. We're seeing it all over, not just here, everywhere. Did you, have you watched the flooding going on right now that where it's flooding where it never has before? That's why the people didn't vacate. It had never flooded there. We, on the news and different documentaries, are talking about how our building in the flood plains and our building where we shouldn't be building is making this worse. Yeah, you already threw Walmart in there and other things that really shouldn't have been put there, but why make it worse? You know, why? If the, yes, places should be able to purchase property, blah, 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 but what about all the people that are already there, who have been there for generations? I mean, I, I mean my fiance and I want to look at putting up a, a new house on my property. We have, we put our, our wedding on hold and talking to the bankers and all that on hold because if they build, we can't 
because I can't afford to be replacing everything over and over again. And neither can my neighbors who had their, their it, it looked like a, a war zone. I mean, plenty of Decorah people, you were driving through and gawking at us while we were trying to clean up. You know, these are our lives you're talking about. And this is more important than money on so many levels. I mean, you all know this. It's, all the information is there, everywhere, all around you. That's really all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. I need a, a point of clarification on Freeport in the sense of what Freeport has done for their constituents as far as averting floods and waters. I know the infrastructure is rather old. I know that there are not, I don't believe, uh, gutters or ways of being able to reduce or send the water that comes when it is a rain event, not a flood event. So at some point, if somebody can explain, not explain, but verify that <coughs> for me, um, that would be helpful as well. Sure. <clears throat> I'm Ardeth Stockman Ramsey, and I did address the planning and zoning, zoning board back in June. Okay. I do live in the infamous Freeport, mm -hmm. in the real town where yes. it started. Um, yes, there are water problems from rainfall, but that also increases the river. It also floods. I live fairly close to the river. I have been there for 22 plus years. I worked in Decorah for 40 years. <coughs> yes, FEMA came in and helped out the newest houses in Freeport. The newest. Back in 93, there was a significant amount of flooding and rain, but we did not have the whole hillside developed with all these expensive houses. There were trees. There weren't roads and curbs. No, we do not have gutters. We do not have any of the stuff to remove our water. Mm -hmm. We shop in Decorah, we work in Decorah, we consider Decorah our home. Our address is Decorah. Mm -hmm. Your decisions affect us. Yes, I don't live in the city limits, but Decorah is my home. Mm -hmm. My address is Decorah. Mm -hmm. um, the traffic out by Walmart and Casey's and the bank is ridiculous. When I drove home from every planning and zoning meeting and I looked over at that field and I saw the peacefulness and the quietness, and yes, that has had water numerous times. Yes, June. numerous. And we have pictures. So anybody who says that there's never been water in that field has never driven by there enough to see it. But the, it, you know, we brought in Walmart, they brought in Walmart, Whenever I read an article about beautiful Decora, and I've read many about how it's one of the most beautiful spots in Iowa, they never talk about the big box stores, about Super Walmart, because I don't believe that was a plus. And I don't believe Menards is a plus. And I will shop wherever they support our veterans and give veterans a break. Freeport is a nice town. We don't need the traffic. And for as far as jobs, people downtown, the chamber gets together all the time with the businesses. They can't find employees. So good luck. Thank you. Um, yes. <clears throat> good evening. My name is Ted Shocker. I live at 1787 Old Stage Road. Here tonight speaking on behalf of the residents who live at these old stage road, uh, road addresses, 1787, 1789, 1783, 1777, and 1781. We wish to formally voice our objection to the Menards rezoning for several reasons. As you have been given 16 items in which to consider, we wish to cite consideration items five, congestion in the street, and seven, promote the health and general welfare. We are concerned about increased traffic on Old Stage Road. 
The current level of traffic makes it dangerous for all of us to exit our driveways and enter the road safely. Some of our property owners have made modifications to their properties already to avoid backing out and to, to travel south. To some of these residents, considerable expense was incurred. With the proposed Menards construction, placing a turning lane into Menards blocks driveways, thereby causing one more element to negotiate when coming to and from our homes. Many of us have had to leave when major traffic is prevalent to get out to our places of employment. When an employer in Freeport Industrial Park has a shift change, the constant flow of traffic makes getting onto the road dangerous. These are shift changes that happen throughout the course of the day. Some of the residents in our neighborhood are young, inexperienced teenage drivers who will travel, who will have to overcome pulling onto on stage, old stage road while avoiding traffic and turn lanes to travel south. We also concur with the many individuals who have brought concerns relative to the floodplain issues. It is the cumulative effect of all of these concerns that we believe you should vote no on the rezoning of this property. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Jim Fritz and I live at 315 Riverview Drive on the banks of the Upper Iowa River and I've lived there for 31 years. I am no stranger to Menards as I have over the last those years I've remodeled or rehabbed or rebuilt or actually built brand new homes and have gone to Menards on many occasions. I purchased from both of their locations in La Crosse and in Rochester. While Menards representatives have expressed frustration with others who question their selection of the location in the floodplain, I find their arguments of retail synergy to be disingenuous at best. I usually have gone to the Onalaska Menards location, a location that is far from the big box shopping area of La Crosse and far from virtually any retail location, period. It sits out in the middle of what used to be a large open field and is not a quick trip from anywhere. You have to want to go there. One of the Menards newest stores was already mentioned is up in La Crosse, or Rochester, excuse me, and it's three miles away from the Super Walmart, 10 minutes. Both of those stores could not have been possibly located for that type of retail synergy that we are being led to believe is so critical for a decor location. So I want to express my frustration for the lack of awareness on Menard's part to the concerns of the members of the decor community who want no more commercial development in our floodplain. People will drive a couple minutes from Walmart to go to Menard's if they're up on the hill. They do it in Rochester and La Crosse every day. If they're at Walmart, they're going to have to get in the car to go to Menards anyway, because you can't walk from one point to the other hardly and carry your <coughs> merchandise with you. Building up in the hill in the industrial park is closer to Walmart than in Rochester or La Crosse. It will have great visibility, and if people want to shop at Menards, they'll be able to find them easily. Thank you for your careful consideration of this very important thing. Thank you very much. One more, and then I'm going to close the hearing. There will be um, other opportunities for hub public hearings as well. Hello, I'm Jim McIntosh, 607 South Mill Street in Decorah. And I tried hard, but I can't resist a microphone. And I want to tell you that, or bring to your attention that to think of this, of this decision, yes or no, in a vacuum can be dangerous because of the fact that there are several things that should also be thought of at the same time. Number one, housing. The uh, University of Iowa, or Iowa State, rather, did a study a couple of years ago that was reported at the library at a presentation there in which in the state of, or in, in the city of Decorah, there, were, there was at that time over 5,000 paying jobs. Those jobs were filled two-thirds of them by people who did not live in the community. So when the, uh, someone mentioned 150 jobs a while ago, that is 100 people that are going to be living out in Spillville <laughs> and other places like that, which is good for them. But w the housing situation, I think, in, in the city needs to be addressed in connection with the decision on Menards. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Let's take another one. Okay. Let's keep going. I'll take one more from the back. Let's keep going. We're okay to be here, right? Okay, just get, let's just keep going. Yeah, yeah, let's just keep going. Let's yeah, get it. We're okay. Let people talk. Let's get okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Jody Eno Spurlog. I live at 2326 265th Avenue in Ridgeway, Iowa. I want to just thank the City Council for what I have observed as a very thoughtful and careful consideration of this issue, which I think is complex. My interest in this is tied to the success of the Decor community where I live, work, play, kids go to school, and also to my background in education and research with what having to do with water quality at the local and state level. I want to, um, I guess I want to give you my response to the Menards letter that I read, um, and in particular, starting with their um, conclusion that Menards that there has been proven without a doubt that constructing a Menard store in this location will not have any negative impact on the surrounding or downstream properties. And that the Iowa Flood Center, along with others, has given their blessing. And I think that's inaccurate and disingenuous as a statement and as a scientist. Um, I have tremendous respect for Larry Weber. I know him personally at the Iowa Flood Center and for their work. I trust that they're somewhere in just less than two inch range is, is, an, is an accurate one with the data that they have available. But I do not believe that that is a conclusion that, that proves without a doubt um, in, in fairness. Um, two inches in a 2008 flood where the main concern with, was a beginning of a breach of the levee, which would have been open to a huge breach in the levee, may have mattered two inches in addition to the 2016 Freeport disaster may have mattered, may have mattered to the extent of something that can't be compensated for by taxes, it may have resulted in a loss of life. And so I'd like these things to be considered um, in the context of how they have presented this. Um, I also feel like I understand Menard's frustration with feeling that other people are dictating where they will build, um, but as a community member, I feel like the reverse is happening as well, that they are dictating where they will build and that's it. And not working with this community is, and especially its sensitive flooding history. And the feeling that we should be grateful because they are considering Decora is also something I feel is disingenuous. I'm, I'm pretty confident that Menards has done the market research that they would need to do to make this sort of investment. And they know the zip codes that not only go to Menards, but they also know that by placing themselves here, they will likely get a lot of the Lowe's and Home Depot business that also goes to Rochester. So they will, they will be um, increasing that business share. So I want to emphasize to the decor community and remind ourselves that this community has assets and that we should not only just be feeling like we're desperate and need anything that comes our way in whatever form. And I want to just highlight a couple of things on a different project I'm working on that I've uncovered. There was one in Wisconsin that was very similar and just released this past summer. This one's a case study in small town community academic development from North Carolina where they looked at small towns across the U.S., less than 10,000 people, and identified those that were not only surviving but also thriving. And here were the four categories. Small towns yeah, about half a minute. that are recreation and retirement destinations or adjacent to abundance of natural areas, with historic downtowns or prominent cultural or heritage assets, and that are adjacent to a college campus. Decora has all of those. And so I want to just, I encourage the council to ask questions in a way that recognizes that we have assets. And th that question includes um, exploring the possibility that other Menards-like stores, if that is something that is really sought here, would be willing, given the market research that says there's, there's a potential here, to build other places than the floodplain and to potentially work with this community in a, in a more positive way. And I'll just ask for a shift in philosophy that involves protecting and working with natural environments rather than trying to control them. 
And I'll end with a Native American prophecy. Only when the last tree has been cut down, the last fish has been caught, and the last stream poisoned will we realize that we cannot eat money. Thank you very much. My name is Linda Peterson, and I live at 1732 252nd Street in Freeport. Um, I agree that having Menards in the area would be an economic boost, but at whose expense? And what cost? Certainly not Menards, not Mr. Edwards. We have had two major floods in the past 10 years. Has he seen any of the damage to the homeowners and had to deal with or pay for out of their own pockets? Um, the only ones FEMA helped out seems to be uh, city and county for infrastructure. Um, I have read what the Iowa Flood Center studies have said. However, I'm not sure that I agree. If you have a 210,000 square foot slab of cement and you put it in the middle of a floodplain, <coughs> it's going to change things. Um, I don't see the advantage of them building next to Walmart. I, I just don't understand why that's such a big issue. Um, has it, and you know, with the flooding, has it been taken into consideration? Not only the increase in rainfall that we've been getting, which the flood center indicates is not going to change, it's only going to increase, that when we get flooded, the city, understandably, has to pump that water back over the dike into the river. Where does that river go? Right down through Freeport. So that adds to the amount of the water. Um, uh, I have also read some of the um, articles that have been written as far as the um, pumping pollutants, all the pollutants that Menards has pumped into our streams. Um, and also the latest one that's been in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune regarding their requests for reduction in taxes that they fight for every year. I was also surprised from the letter that Mr. Edwards sent to the, I guess I wasn't really surprised, I was half expecting it, that he sent to the city council indicating um, all the benefits as far as money for the taxes, for the school, and everything else. Um, and then in, in closing, he says that if they don't get to build where they want to build, they won't come to Decorah. Well, I'm sorry, to me that kind of sounds like a two-year-old. But I encourage them to come to Decorah. I just don't want them to build in that floodplain. They're going to get their projected profits. Doesn't make any difference if they go east, west, south, or whatever out of town, or up on a hill, or anywhere. I just don't feel that we should jeopardize our floodplains anymore. And when the Iowa Flood Center, or the Iowa Flood Center made their studies, they also encouraged us to watch and not damage our floodplains anymore by further building. Okay. So I encourage you to vote no. Thank you very much. Tyler. Thank you. 
I wanted to visually show you some things that we've been talking about. Because um, this has been a long process, uh, and, and I think we're kind of coming to some sort of resolution here at the end. Um, but I'm going to change what I talk about first, uh, based on the guy that talked, made the first comment about Menards um, suing over the city council decision. Um, that would never happen. We are not your enemy. We are not against you. Um, and we, we wouldn't do something like that. We're, we're trying to come in on the same team um, with, with the project we think is going to benefit both Decora and Menards. Um, so starting from there, um, I've highlighted the seven counties that make up what will be our trade area at the Decora Menards store. There's 113,000 people that live in those seven counties. Um, I'm going to round it down to just under 100,000 uh, because a half of Fillmore County in Minnesota is a little bit faster to get to Rochester. Um, so we're going we're gonna to stick just under 100,000. You might think, um, sure, I've heard, there we go, everybody talking about, well, if they drive that far, they'll drive up the hill. Um, and you probably have to thank your mayor for calling me several times and making us reconsider the site up the hill. Um, she and I have spent probably a couple hours on the phone talking about alternative sites in town so far. Um, and we actually did. We really went back and reevaluated um, the whole community thanks to our dialogue. And what you come up with is uh, the site next to Walmart, which we're all talking about, um, the site up the hill, which I'll talk about in a little more detail in a second in the business park. And then the only other alternatives, because Decorah is so hilly and has the river and everything, are, are probably way past the university uh, up here that are big enough to accommodate something like Menards. If that's so far out, um, you know, that couldn't be considered. And then probably uh, way, way past the airport, because airports have flight landing zones, so all this land is, is really unusable in the path of the, run the runway. So when we get to next, is that airport site that we've talked so much about. Um, when I was talking to Lorraine, we went back and reevaluated the whole thing. And I think it was mentioned earlier that along the front, um, there's some power lines, a, a county ditch that sees a lot of water, and some DOT right away. Um, along the back, there's a parcel that's not quite owned by the Corps of Jobs yet. And what is a, a, a ravine is actually a stream tributary to the upper Iowa River, um, which to say is this blue line on the map. And that is a, a protected waterway and tributary from a, a state and federal level. Extremely difficult to fill, relocate, or remove one of those. Um, and in fact, in order to do that, you have to prove that there is not a viable alternative. Um, and given the fact that DNR has signed off on an alternative, I don't think we could fill, relocate, or move that stream. Um, so without that being moved, um, in the current power line issue, there's actually not enough room there. It's only 600 feet wide. Menards needs at least 800 feet wide, which we have on the, um, the Walmart property. From, from end to end, it, it's 800 feet wide. Now, I think there was a little, I don't want to call it miscommunication, but so much happened so fast in the Planning Commission. Um, we didn't really get to talk about the actual rezoning request uh, to the level I wanted to. I just want to clarify that we are not rezoning all 27 acres. Um, about half of that, which I've highlighted in blue, is staying in the flood district and the flood plain. It's actually going down. There's more flood plain storage in that section near the river um, than there is today. And by not bringing in fill to the site, um, there's, there's, there's more floodplain back there. So we're only rezoning 17 acres for the Menard store. And I want to make sure that we are clear on that because the comprehensive plan shows the frontage along Old Stage Road as commercial. 
sure we may be a little bit beyond what the 2012 graphic shows, uh, but I think even back then they planned on commercial being there. Um, so, so we're not going beyond what was planned in that study way back then. And of course, you know, we recently had the DNR go out and establish the floodway and floodplain lines. These are not, they're not old. Um, they were just done in 2017. So all this information that we're dealing with um, is brand new after the last two big floods that came through town. Um, so that in that second, uh, I'll call it uh, flood center report, um, I think did a really good job taking things to the next level. So we, you know, the first flood report said that there's one or one-ish inches or 0.13 feet of additional flood playing up to the fairgrounds uh, because of the Menards and the 2008 flood. Well, the second one went way beyond that, added 25% to that flood, which if that flood got 25% worse, everyone's last concern is going to be Menards. It's probably going to be tipping over the, the city dikes and, and flooding everywhere else. Um, so, and it, it only raised it to 0.18 feet. So I, th I think that's about a half an inch more up to the fairgrounds. And, and I sympathize with everyone that got flooded in the, in the past events, um, but I, I think it, it's, it's been said that wasn't because of Walmart, that wouldn't be because of Menards, the bridge down there backs water up, um, there's no dike downriver, um, there's, there's, there's other issues at play um, that we wouldn't be, be a factor in. And so I think that's what we've been trying to convey. We've been trying to put our best foot forward and just convey facts. Um, you guys obviously have the ultimate decision. Um, I think we've, we've laid out some of the economic benefits. We've talked about our site selection um, and tried to put together some facts and figures from independent bodies, um, which would be the flood center and the DNR. I, Dan, I think you asked, um, about other floodplain permits we did, and I, I think I responded and said um, Ames and Dubuque were two that we did in the last year in Iowa, um, and I asked the flood people at the DNR, they said they issue about 45, I think is what I said, floodplain fill permits um, every single year. Um, so it's not uncommon, and little alone fact, we, we actually had our first set of plans rejected by the DNR when we turned them in. We actually went back and made some changes um, lowered the elevations, uh, removed a, a dike and spillway around the backside um, in order to meet the requirements. So they do not just rubber stamp things. Um, they do have a, a somewhat stringent requirement. Um, and you know, the lifespan of Menards is a long time. So obviously this is a lot to consider. Probably end up being I mean, your legacy as a council. Um, so I realize there's a lot to consider. I know that's daunting in some ways. Um, but I think we've presented the facts in the best way possible. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, we're excited. Uh, this is, Decorah, just so you know, is the smallest town I could find a Menard store in. Um, and I, I did a lot of research when I was looking up Walmarts next to other Menard stores and that sort of thing. You know, you can talk about the Rochesters and La Crosses um, not being next to a Walmart. Um, but you got to understand, there's like a half million people in Rochester. Um, La Crosse and Onalaska are surrounded by houses. If that, there was a site like that in Decorah, um, that would make that decision a little different. But there's about seven or 8,000 people in Decorah, so we have to make sure um, that we we'll locate in, in the retail area. I think we've done a good job proving that we're not going to flood anyone's houses, no roads. We're not asking you guys for any money. Um, no, no public financing. I mean, you get to keep all the, the sales tax and property taxes. Um, and that, that's, that's really what I have, of course, open to questions. And if you heard anything from the public that you want me to answer, I'm happy to do that, too. I have a question. Um, you said that site plan is kind of a cookie cutter site plan that you guys have for the most part or that store design you said that in the past is that correct yeah we only build one store prototype they're all 200,000 square feet every new store is the same size now now the back portions of it you can see it's angled here um, that's because we cut some yard out we didn't need that at this particular location so we um, took that out to 
try to reduce our impact as much as we could. Um, so I know you referenced the frontage road along along Old Stage um, and how a portion of your site plan would be in the floodplain it needs to be rezoned. Yet there's a, an, a parcel adjacent to the, the parcel that you're proposing. Have you looked at it and considered um, instead of doing your site plan you know, vertically or in depth going towards the river to more of like a horizontal so it would stay out of the floodplain yet still meet your needs. Obviously that's a, a change in, in the design. Yeah, that is a change direction. We actually looked at buying that parcel way back, probably before I even talked to you guys. Um, or talked to the city staff, just, just to lie out. Didn't know about the floodplain back then, but we did investigate that parcel. So every Menard store has a set um, width and um, depth, and, the, and it's both. It's about a square. It's about 800 by 800, because the store itself is about three. There's about 540 feet wide, plus 150 feet of garden center, or down to 120, I guess. So that's still your length into the floodplain. You're still going to be into the floodplain about the same, um, maybe a little less than you would today. So yeah, you're reducing the impacts a little bit, um, but then you're also going to be funneling all the traffic to one entrance. Um, you're going to be facing the uh, the side of the building rather than the front. I don't know. That's more of an aesthetic issue. So it was explored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, we've looked at that, and I think I think the mayor brought up that on one of our phone calls was reorienting the site or shrinking it down or a different footprint, and we went through that sort of thing. Do you know if on the AIM site if they're doing semi-permeable pavement because it's in a flood plain? No. No, you no. don't know or no, they are not? No, they're not. Okay. No, they're not. Um, it, it's being raised out of the flood plain. Um, similar situation on that site. Uh, the flood way is next to the Skunk River. Um, there's a pond kind of between the two, and then the store is, is, is next to that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Consider resolution 2925 setting a public hearing on rezoning of property Menards Inc. 1780 Old Stage Road, <coughs> County Road A52 parcel to C4 Shopping Center Commercial. Can you give me information on that? So why do we have to do another public hearing? So the one, the one thing, if you put conditions on rezoning, you have to have an agreement in writing by the property owner for those conditions. We don't have that, and the one condition that I'm concerned about that uh, you would think is implied, the statute doesn't necessarily say that, is the board, only the Board of Adjustment can put, can approve fill in a floodplain. If the City Council votes to amend the zoning ordinance to make this C4 commercial without the Board of Adjustment approving the floodplain, my concern is there's an argument we violated our own city code because the floodplain is defined as a specific uh, elevation based upon the 100 year flood plus whatever foot or whatever it is. So, and I've talked to Tyler about this. We had kind of a complicated development agreement before that also tied in the uh, site plan. And without, uh, to avoid going into all the, uh, the nitty gritty of the site plan and the different variables in there, we could boil this uh, agreement down to just that one issue. Uh, Menard's agreeing that any uh, city council rezoning is conditioned on board of adjustment approval of of a of a fill permit. So, uh, Mr. Onsager brought up that Peterson case, and one of the key issues about that is you consider is the process. Make sure you follow the right process. Uh, the the end result is important, but in for my job. <laughs> The process is more important. Make sure that the end result matches up with, is supported by the process you go through. Uh, and one of those things is you can't rezone this property 
if the elevation isn't increased? And we get this chicken and the egg type question, well, what do you do first? Go to the Board of Adjustment and request the fill permit? Or do you go to zoning? Well, my problem, if you ask me about going to the Board of Adjustment first is, why would they, why would they authorize a fill permit just for a fill permit because you still have to rezone the property to put a store there. Uh, and so if Board of Adjustment issued a fill permit, I would say, I guess if they asked me, my advice would be, well, don't you need to consider making that conditional on the city council approving a, uh, a rezoning request? Because just by giving a fill permit, you don't change the zoning status and a Menards type store is not allowed in a floodplain. So to back it up, bottom line is why do we need a third public hearing if Menards agrees to the fact, agrees that uh, uh, to put a store there you need a fill permit, we need something in writing from them that they agree that any rezoning by the city council is subject to approval of the Board of Adjustment of a fill permit. And going back to the Menards decision in 2003, one of the issues there was the Supreme Court didn't like the City Council maybe overstepping its authority and making a decision that the Board of Adjustment had jurisdiction over. And in that case, it was a fill permit. So um, it's hard to separate the two, and again, that's why and so back to the, the specific words of the statute are that the, the city council can impose reasonable conditions on rezoning, but only if they're approved in writing or agreed to in writing by the property owner prior to the public hearing on the request to rezone. And that's also something I've talked to Tyler about. We, um, it says property owner, so that's Dalen, actually. So obviously Menards is the one driving it, but it would uh, it would have to be uh, Dalen that asked for it. And not to discount Tyler's statement that Menards doesn't sue, but you still have to follow the statute to make sure that we're following the right process. It seems to me that I think the, the best uh, action going forward is to send this to the Board of Adjustment for consideration before we rule on it. I'm going to side with John on this one. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? No. Yeah, yeah, repeat what he said. No, 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 he he that explained it. That's what I thought. Some some this this makes approval. sense. We need to have the Board of Adjustment weigh in on it, I think, before we do. Our decision is a political decision. Their decision is a quasi-judicial one. And uh, the, the only recourse uh, after, uh, if they dispute that, is to go to, to court over it. Well, and that's exactly right. It's called the, uh, that, that, that's, well, you said it better than I did. The uh, Board of Adjustment, their decision is quasi-judicial, and the City Council is primarily a policy decision. Now, there's some gray area, and the Iowa Supreme Court has gone back and forth about this, about whether the City Council action is quasi-judicial or not, but I would say that the most recent decision says just that. Um, but I, whose decision is that as far as whether it goes to Board of Adjustment first or City Council? I mean, it's, I, some of that I would say is up to the applicant, uh, which decision they make. I guess the City Council, could you defer? Uh, it's still I, contingent or conditioned it's, on. It's still conditioned on. Uh, I can't say that there's any reason why you can't do it. I can't say I've seen an example where that's been done, said, but it is still the same outcome. And I would say with Board of Adjustment. Well, in, in the Walmart case, they went to the Board of Adjustment first. Well, uh, and that may be. I might, my memory they said, of. Yes, and they said no. Actually, that was, it was not Walmart, it was the. Uh, the Upper Iowa Marine went yep. to the Board of Adjustment first. Correct, I'm correct. Yeah, and that's the interesting, I would go into this, but right. that's the interesting thing in that, in that time, Upper Iowa Marine got their fill permit denied by the Board of Adjustment, but Menard, or Walmart got their fill permit approved by the City Council, something like that. Right. And it was, again, not the right process that was right. done. And I guess with the, the development agreement we drafted before, which uh, Menards kind of 
in principle had agreed to, but not officially. Because of kind of the complicated chicken and the egg, what you do first, it was an agreement between the city and Menards partially. This is the process we'll use. And it was kind of a two-step process. And it's just a suggestion, but at a minimum, if the city council is going to hold a vote on rezoning, my advice is you need at least Menards to agree that it's subject to uh, and conditioned on Board of Adjustment approval. Um, hope I didn't confuse you if more. If we went to the Board of Adjustment first, would we be giving up any ability to put development language into the agreement? Well, okay, so here would be a, que here would be a question I have. If the Board of Adjustment approved the fill permit, What's your basis for, for denying a rezoning application if the, if the land has been raised above the flood stage? And I, I mean, there's some, whole, there's some issues there that you would have to look at, and, but that's a question. I mean, not to give somebody else a legal argument here, but I mean, that's a question in my mind. Uh, could we deny the, the application at that point? Maybe, I, maybe, but it's, it raises that question. But if we wanted to put in some sort of stipulation that money would be put, funds would be allocated from a development agreement standpoint into a floodplain mitigation plan, like was mentioned before, if we went to the Board of Adjustment first, would we lose our ability to put language into a development agreement? Those things still seem tied to the site plan approval process and not the rezoning. Uh, yes, although I, there is some overlap between that site plan and the rezoning when you're talking about concerns about flooding. Um, I guess I've, if, if you do it all now, it, the, the development plan, and you take it a look at the whole thing, um, it takes away some of the questions uh, and the legal uncertainty about what happens. Uh, again, if we have, again, the, this, what we've uh, drafted so far, it's not truly a development agreement because Menards isn't asking for anything. It's more of an agreement about how to go through the process. So I call it a site plan and rezoning uh, agreement, but it's, it, it tries to address some of these things and about how to look at it and when you look at it. And ultimately, it gives the city council a second look at everything because there's a lot of moving parts here. And if you change one thing, how does that affect your decision on something else? So um, that gets a little bit more complicated. If you want a, a, a simple approach to this, and it might not be the right approach, or the preferred approach is, yeah, if Menards agrees to the mm -hmm. rezoning being subject to Board of Adjustment approval, um, you hold a vote on it. If you want to look at everything maybe at a, in a broader picture, you maybe look at a site plan and rezoning agreement all at the same time. I guess I would say, though, if you vote down just because of the rezoning, you've spent a lot of time on the site plan issue um, that maybe you didn't need to. That's something to consider. So I will say also, when we set the, hear the hearing for uh, the next public hearing, we have to pub we do have to publish notice for that, and the notice requirements are a little bit uh, longer than your typical notice. So we just, just keep that in mind. We can do it, uh, but perhaps the city council doesn't want to set that public hearing until Menards has agreed to that condition too. I mean that would that would somewhat make sense. And I just talked to Tyler about this tonight, so I don't know that he's in a position to provide an answer on my proposal. Uh, right now, but he might be able to give feedback <laughs> if I put him on the spot. <clears throat> well, that certainly is sort of clear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will state, though, that it's more clear than it was at 2.30 this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to move to approve resolution 2925 setting the public hearing. Second. For what date? Um, so well, October 1st. I mean, we can do that, correct? That's we can. Yeah, we can get the notice. Uh, again, if Menards hasn't agreed to those conditions, then I have a question in my mind legally. Um, 
are you, is the city council saying it's still subject to board of adjustment approval? Because you can't put conditions on on anything unless they've agreed to it in writing beforehand. Before the hearing takes place. Yeah, they can, and actually I think the, the statute says before the adjournment, so I suppose they could walk into the hearing <clears throat> and not have signed the agreement and then sign it, you know, in, at the public hearing. Worst case scenario, if there's no agreement prior to the public hearing, then what? We should, it's a quick, it's a quick public hearing. It's a quick public hearing. It's yeah. Just another one. And, and, yeah, I guess that's the worst case. And I, there's no harm in having. <laughs> we have another one. <laughs> I, I motion to approve resolution 2925 to set the public hearing uh, for October 1st. I'll second it. Any discussion? <laughs> I personally think it should be tabled until such time as an agreement has been reached and signed so that we can do the next hearing and move on rather than possibly have a hearing for no purpose and have to have another hearing. You got a motion and a second. And We're discussion. having a discussion. Yeah. I'm just waiting to see if anybody else is going to jump in the discussion. I'd like to see us ready to go if the agreement is signed and we're able to move the, the next step forward on October 1st. Would you be ready for action on the ordinance to amend the zoning code after this public hearing? In other words, would you be ready to vote on October 1st? That was 1st? my assumption that's what would take place. Not if there's not an agreement signed. Correct. Understood. And would board of, when does Board of Adjustment meet? Uh, we've missed the publication <coughs> deadline for their October meeting, so it'll be the 1st of November before they'll be ready. So we'll have another two weeks. In that case, you would only be, <coughs> you would only be considering this resolution, not the agreement to rezone. On the no, first I think we're saying we of a bar. No, I'm asking if you would be ready to hold this public hearing, close the public hearing, and then take a vote on the amended rezoning. Only if an agreement on the condition. Been signed. Yes. Well, Steve's got an extra condition that is internal to this body, and that is that you have a signed agreement. Right. But the the rezoning should be conditional on the Board of Adjustments approval. And so that would be the motion two weeks or yeah, in October one. It would be we the would craft it better than that, that but yes. <laughs> right? Right. And if, if the uh, development agreement was not signed before to October 1st, we could close a very quick public hearing and push a decision, another public hearing and decision back two weeks, still with a November Board of Adjustment agenda for the full permit. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to clarify the public hearing and development agreement we're talking about is the agreement that the board of adjustment has to approve it. Yeah, and I and it's I just on the rezoning the plan. It's like 20 pages long. That's a separate development agreement. Right. Well, I'm trying to simplify it okay. for purposes of just uh, having a vote on the rezoning Rezone. itself without digging into the details of the site plan. To you know, can can we get over that issue or not? And so, uh, what I just gave you before today is. Just Menards and Dalens agreeing that uh, any rezoning is subject to Board of Adjustment approval of a fill permit. Okay. That's easy enough to review and get signed before the first. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Roll call. Bill Richard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Hadley. Aye. Bergen. Aye. Chisel. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Loose. Aye. Okay. Consider Ordinance 20, uh, 1224 approving re requested rezoning classification for David and Julie Olson, uh, 1006 Woodside Court property parcel to R2 single four family residential district second reading. 
make a motion for approval of ordinance 1224. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Carlson. Aye. Hadley. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Luce. Aye. Bell Richard. Aye. Chisel. Aye. Bergen. Aye. Consider ordinance 12. 25 approving requested rezoning of property. I see Haugen Home property. Oh, sorry. I see Haugen Properties for Ohio Street property at West Highland Drive, a parcel from HM Hospital Medical District to R3 Multiple Family Residential District. I move for, I approval. Move for approval of Ordinance 1225 and uh, move to waive the third reading. Uh, do I'm sorry. Do the second one. For, do the second reading first. Do the second. I'll do the second. Yeah, and I'm then sorry. do another motion okay. after you take the care of them. Move for approval. <coughs> Any discussion? Who seconded? Um, Bell Richard. Randy. 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 I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Roll call. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Luce. Aye. Hadley. Aye. Bergen. Aye. Chisel. Aye. Bell Richard. Aye. And I move to uh, waive the third reading of Ordinance 1225. And adopt. And adopt. Thank you. Second. Have we had any comments at City Hall? I've not received any comments at City Hall on this sort. That's part of the discussion. Any other discussion? I had a, I had a call from a, a developer asking to to sort of expedite this because they want to move before the weather gets any worse. Roll call. Johnson. Aye. Hadley. Aye. Bergen. Aye. Chisel. Aye. Bell Richard. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Luce. Aye. Okay, city manager, department head, and council report. I just. Can I speak on the echo development thing for a second? I never got a chance to say anything. Uh, we'll stay for a committee yeah, meeting. Yeah, we're going to have a committee meeting. You're going to, on the echo piece? That's on our agenda. And that's tonight. No, echo's not on that piece. Okay. Oh, never mind. Um, no, I thought it was. That's on the one, too. That's not. Okay. I guess it's not on the agenda, is it? That's not. Oh, okay. It was earlier. Huh? It was earlier. It's up to you. <laughs> is that the discussed regarding proposal to purchase city property? No. Three, no. Uh, it was item six and seven at the top of the agenda. We can take home. Did we miss something? No. No, no we okay. said a public hearing. So there'll be a public hearing. Yeah. There will be a public hearing on that, correct? There'll be two public hearings uh, on October 1st for the Echo Development Project. Okay. And at that time, probably, that would be appropriate for me to speak at that time? Yes. Okay. Okay. City manager. Uh, just three quick things. Uh, one, I'm asking the street committee to consider setting a uh, meeting on the Oneota Drive Bridge RFPs. Those were handed out at the last uh, city council meeting for uh, the street committee's review. Um, so I would ask the committee to set a meeting to review those and select a consultant on the Oneota Drive Bridge. Uh, and the same request is made for the Locust Road Improvement Project. Um, several weeks ago, the council heard presentations from some possible engineering vendors, so I would ask that the committee meet and discuss those two items. Uh, second, uh, city engineer Lindsay Erdman and I uh, have been talking uh, regarding a speed study on Highland Street uh, East with Helena Avenue um, at the request of one of Andy Carlson's constituents, I think, or at least a contact. Um, about speed on that street and, and in reviewing that I think we'll have a recommendation shortly that we can kind of review uh, as to any speed control uh, in that area. Uh, and third and finally, um, upon the advice of the Iowa DOT Traffic Enforcement uh, Division, uh, they're re recommending some changes to our engine braking ordinance uh, and they've provided some language that John and I will review. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, there are some weight restrictions in that engine braking ordinance that really don't need to be there. 
Uh, so we'll bring a drafted ordinance back to the council for consideration at a later date. That's all I have. Department okay. uh, heads? Just mentioning that um, you'll begin to see, I think, in earnest this week, the street work beginning. We'll have work on Park Street's alley ends uh, this week, and we will begin curb work, I believe, on East Broadway, as well as the storm sewer work on Winnesheek Avenue. So I don't know if they will all happen tomorrow at 8 a.m., but they are scheduled as long as the weather begins to get, stays reasonable to to begin to get into some of these things and then hopefully move from one spot to the next as they move through the project. So I, I should mention as well, I appreciate your um, approval on the Doug Road project. I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, Hollins for their cooperation and their uh, patience in that project. There was a lot of steps, a lot of different things to work through. It lasted longer just simply because of our negotiating our temporary road in the campground and our flooded situation and uh, uh, they were very cooperative and it was it was a good uh, uh, arrangement and we appreciate their help. So that temporary road, road that got washed out a couple, so that was for the trout run? That was, yeah, everything that we hauled to the site, first of all we hauled it all away to get it out of there and then it was re-ground up and blended back together again into a a rock mix that was acceptable to the soils company. So it went out and then it came back and none of it could go across the bridge because our bridge wasn't load limit, our bridge is load limited enough that we had to find another way. So that temp road was intended to go in, take it out. We knew it had to come out because we knew we were gonna have to wait for the asphalt work until later. We didn't expect the flood to do the work taking it out for us, but uh, that meant we had to put it back at least once and, and they did that. Um, so. It, it all worked out in the end, and we have notified FEMA that we're done, but it wasn't quite planned that exact way. I just want to notify the public that we're, right, we have a free compost giveaway day this weekend. Um, Friday it will be 8 till 3, and Saturday it will be 8 till noon, and that's for uh, city residents and non-city residents. Anybody that wants wood chips or compost, come get them. we got plenty. Thank you. Starting next week, uh, we will be doing our yearly hydrant maintenance. We'll be flushing hydrants and exercising hydrants. Um, some residents may experience a little bit of discoloration and some cloudy water, but it'll clear up over time. The monthly meeting of the Decor Parks and Recreation Board will be this Thursday night at 7, right here. Well, we attended the annual Iowa City, League of Iowa Cities conference in Council Bluffs last week, and I can honestly say that my car mates were more fun than a root canal, because I had one on Tuesday morning prior to leaving. <laughs> uh, and um, it is a great conference. I wish more of the council would take the opportunities to go to these things. Um, the one that really impressed me was the one on the fire departments to where they use a ultra, and I don't have the terms, but they really break the water down into very small parts and in 14 seconds they can put out a fully engulfed car fire with about 12 gallons of water. And the whole unit costs about $90,000, can be operated by two people and they the city of Middleton, Wisconsin, and Nevada, Iowa are now using them um, for first attacks. They're the first two guys at the fire station go, and they fill the main engines to come out behind them and provide support. But it's very it was very impressive watching that video. So that was my take from there. Um, there's going to be an economic development and property committee uh, right after this. Um, I was just going to mention that we have a constituent that, that sends us information regarding matters um, on the city council. 
And I really appreciate whoever this constituent is uh, taking the time and the interest in the matters uh, at the city council's hands. But it would be beneficial for whoever this person is if they would like to have some dialogue to try to figure out why things are the way they are, why we vote the way we vote. Um, we can't do that without knowing who this person is. So if there's to ever be any resolution to what they're writing to us, um, I would at least put my hand out there and say, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. I second what Dan has to say about that. Um, also, I talked to uh, some Alliant reps. Um, we're still working on a franchise agreement, so don't worry. We're still working on it. It's a slow moving process, but we are moving forward. So hopefully we're going to be this week, I believe. <coughs> right, right. <coughs> was also in attendance at the Iowa League of Cities, and uh, the only part of it, but what I was there, very enjoyed, and also a good opportunity to interact and work with fellow council and city people in terms of activities. And uh, all I can say about Council Bluffs is I was extremely impressed with their public art. Uh -huh. Um, I would also just say thank you for the opportunity to ten, attend the Iowa League of Cities conference. Um, you learn something in every session. It's great. Nothing there. Nothing there. Okay. Uh, just wanted to thank you for uh, welcoming me to the city council and giving me this opportunity to be here for the next nine months. Um, I don't think there's really anything that I have to report other than that family weekend is this weekend up at Luther. Uh, so I know my parents and several hundred other Luther student parents are looking forward to coming to Decor this weekend. Well, it's nice having you here. And did you actually miss your class and stay with us so you could do this exciting conversation? I have a class on Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, oh, there. That's that was the key. Okay. <laughs> Um, I also went to the league. Um, the ones that highlighted for me were what's next, which has to do with succession planning, which we've got some things coming up where we'll be talking about that. Um, a presentation by the league research director on Show Me the Money, and there will be uh, various reports coming out prior to budget as far as how low of a um, levy we have and how the inflation keeps going up and we're not getting enough money to fill part of that in. Also, I went to uh, tax increment finance, which was very informative. And um, the other thing we did was a great trivia on the way home to get, be able to fill in a few of the miles between A's. That was, that was after the root canal wore off. That's right. <laughs> and it had to do with local option sales tax. So I found that's very informa good information on local option sales tax. Do I have a motion to So moved. The meeting? <laughs> uh, 